This video is sort of weird. I promise it does not represent a change in direction for my channel going forward. If my channel has a direction. It's just something that's been in my head for so long. And the best way to get it out of my head is to talk about it. Hi, this is going to be a more casual video, as you can tell, because I look like shit. For some reason, my idea of a casual video is um, an attempted fascist takeover of the United States. Warren Buffett is a real quote factory when it comes to investing. My favorite holding period is forever. Buy into a company because you want to own it, not because you want the stock to go up. And, of course, buy the dip. Of course, as an investor, I have an absolutely endless collection of Warren Buffett quotes which I pull out of my ass the second I need to convince people that I know what I'm doing. There was of course that one time my dumb whore of a wife told me that spending all my money on lottery tickets is not actually a wise investment. But uh, the fact is, diversification is a protection against ignorance. But there's one quote I really love. It will, uh... It will be very relevant to the story I share today. There's class warfare, all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's making war, and we're winning. You know, originally, I had two pages in my script where I detailed how exactly they were winning and the methods and all that, but you know, the, the sky's blue. Do you really need me to cite a fucking source? This is a story about war, class war and war classic. This is a story about how war is a racket. The oldest one there is. I want you to imagine something. At the age of 17, you're sent to war in Europe to fight what you were told is the war to end all wars. You lose your legs to a German mine and your virginity to a French whore. You come back home, having been told that you've made the world safe for democracy, but you struggle to feel safe in your own house at night, as the trenches of the Somme and the trench between the French whore's legs haunt you while you try to sleep. A great war is followed by a great depression, you ain't got no legs and no money, disfigured and homeless. You go to Washington, D.C., and you are not alone. You are joined by 20,000 other disgruntled World War I veterans. You all camp at the outskirts of the city, demanding that the bonuses you were told you would be paid in 1945 instead be paid now. The federal government says no. Then the army shows up, chases you off, and burns down your camps. What do you do next? You and your 20,000 hopeless, angry, combat-trained friends. We interrupt this program to bring you- This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, and honestly, I have a history with VPNs. I used to be stationed in Turkey as a tactical femboy, and while there, I could not access Wikipedia. This blocking of the internet's greatest repository of knowledge was, obviously, ridiculous and unethical. But using a VPN, I could get around it, so I could enrich myself with knowledge on the production process of Boss Baby. Later, when I was stationed in Germany, I used a VPN to get around region locking, so I could watch Season 8 of Game of Thrones because HBO Go was locked to America. Now, I know what you're thinking. Can you use a VPN to watch good shows that are region locked as well? Yeah! You know, theoretically, I haven't tried. Oh, but you're American, you say? None of this based and red-pilled circumventing of government regulations is relevant to your daily life, of dunking on Euro trash and eating food filled with chemicals Europe has banned. Well, guess what? America's getting sketchy. I don't know how to tell you this. The FBI now flags you if you use terms like Chad or Stacy, because that apparently makes you liable to commit incel terrorism. Your tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen, 
but by using Surfshark VPN, you can call people chads to your heart's content, the way our founding fathers intended. Surfshark VPN has over 3,200 servers in over 100 countries, and I promise that at least one of those countries will let you call people chad without putting you on a list, breaking down your door, and calling you a virgin. Browse the internet the way it was meant to be used, unrestricted, untracked, and privately. Get 83% off and three months for free by using discount code COBBLER or clicking my link in the description. Thank you Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Smedley Butler. At the age of 16, I took three of those gas station boner pills at once to see what would happen. But that's not relevant to the story. When Smedley Butler was 16, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and was swiftly sent to Cuba to fight in the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War is one of those wars we just sorta don't talk about, mostly because we won pretty easily and it was started for a reason that no one really gives a shit about anymore. The conflict started because the Spanish sunk a US ship off the coast of Cuba. I'm gonna give you a very rough recounting of Butler's time in the Marine Corps, but if there's one thing that you leave this traipse through his life with, it should be the knowledge that he did right by his men, and was damn good at his job. When Smedley Butler would end up dying, after the conclusion of our story, as a civilian to be clear, he would end up dying as the most decorated man in Marine Corps history up to that point. He is one of only 19 men to win the Medal of Honor twice. When Butler was stationed in the Philippines with 50 troops under him, they had truly horrible provisions. As far as I'm aware, there was nothing to eat but hard tack, hash, coffee, and tactical femboy dick. Truly dire circumstances. After Butler's requests for better provisions were repeatedly ignored by the Navy higher-ups at a base nearby, Butler set out to the base in a small boat before a typhoon suddenly appeared, nearly capsizing his ship and almost drowning Butler. But Butler would fight through the storm and return with vegetables and beef for his men. After having fought Mother Nature herself, as well as, perhaps even more frighteningly, Navy officers who did not give a shit what some Marines in buttfuck were eating for supper. That's a fun and uplifting story, isn't it? It's the last one in the video. Butler, later in his career, would install American-friendly regimes in Nicaragua and Haiti, even going so far as to rig an election in Nicaragua. It was these events which took a toll on Butler, instilling in him a deep disillusionment of the US military and its role in the world. Butler would eventually find his way to France during World War I, far later in his career. But he would not see the front lines. Butler got promoted at this point to Brigadier General and found himself in command of Camp Pontenezin, a miserable camp with deplorable living conditions. Camp Pontenezin was where American troops and supplies would enter and leave Europe, and was therefore two things simultaneously. Number one, it was a place of immeasurable importance to the war effort. Number two, it was a hell-fuck muddy nightmare place where hope died. Butler did not want to be in charge of a huge camp which was falling apart miles from the front. Butler wanted to be in the trenches, that's just the kind of guy he was, but he made the best of it, turning the camp around completely. He issued double rations of food, six blankets to a man, and would have hot soup served all day. But it wasn't all fun and games and six blankets to a man, which I presume were used to construct pretty kick-ass blanket forts. At Camp Pontenezin, Butler watched men, boys really, get off the boat, go to the front, and come back broken. For the first time in Butler's long career, he had a bird's eye view of war, and it was the most brutal war in human history. Years later, Butler would remark on the experience. Gradually, it began to dawn on me to wonder what on earth these American boys are doing getting wounded and killed and buried in France. Butler's last overseas deployment in his career would be during the Civil War in China between the very fun to say Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong, and the last great deed that Butler performed for his country was saving an American Standard Oil refinery from a fire. Butler had given his life for the Marine Corps. He joined the Corps a bright-eyed and hairy-lipped teenager, but grew into a cynical old general. His every attempt to protect his troops landed him in hot water with the brass, and it seemed he spent more time protecting American business interests 
than he did American lives. He began giving speeches across the country when he returned home. One of these speeches would spell the end of his career. It was at this point that a certain Benito Mussolini had come to power in Italy. Fascism, as an ideology, rose to prominence with him. Butler, while giving a speech, shared a story he'd heard from a close friend that had ridden in a car driven by Mussolini through the Italian countryside. Mussolini had driven over a small child, goes the story, causing the passenger to scream in horror. At this point, Mussolini turned to the passenger, put his hand on his knee, and said, Now, now, what is one death in matters of state? Now, of course, that story is not true. Mussolini said something else after he ran over the child. Italy was, at the time, friendly to America. So, a high-ranking marine general, saying their leader, ran over children, caused an international incident. However, I think if the same thing happened today, uh, like, no one would even care. The chief of staff could literally say that Justin Trudeau fucks dogs, and no one would care. Butler would end up getting court-martialed due to these public comments, but the charges were dropped due to bad publicity. He was something of an American hero, as I'm sure you can imagine. But it was during this debacle, he decided, finally, after over 30 years of service to the Marine Corps, to retire. But you've probably already figured something out about Smedley Butler. This is a man that loved to fight. He just began to think he was fighting on the wrong side. Sometimes I get dangerously close to being happy. And it is in those moments that I look up the history of American labor disputes. It always really brings me back down to my base level, you know. You see the death toll after some Pinkertons or even the National Guard rolled up and started killing fuckers. And then you learn that they went on strike in the first place because they wanted a 40-hour work week. Smedley Butler was a member of many veterans' organizations, and the largest of these was the American Legion. The word fascist is thrown around a lot these days, so I would like to be very clear. The American Legion was fascist in a very real and dangerous way. Yes, it's true. They bought the new Harry Potter game, and legend says... They thought it was pretty good, too. In 1923, while still national commander of the American Legion, Alvin Ousley was quoted by Newspaper Enterprise Association as having said, If ever needed, the American Legion stands ready to protect the country's institutions and ideals, as the fascists dealt with obstructionists who menaced Italy. Do not forget that the fascists are to Italy what the American Legion is to the United States. When asked if he would go so far as to take over government, he replied, exactly that. The American Legion were also jackbooted thugs employed by capitalists to break American strikes and use nationalistic rhetoric to advocate against policies that were socialist. You know, like welfare programs or regulation of big business, like real common sense shit that we mostly have today. Uh, this is also the part of the story where the Great Depression happened, by the way. Butler's public speeches became even more inflammatory after he retired from the Marine Corps. On August 21st, 1931, at an American Legion convention in Connecticut, Butler said, I spent 33 years being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. I helped in the rape of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I had a swell racket. I was rewarded with honors, medals, promotions. I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate a racket in three cities. The Marines operated on three continents. As you can imagine, Butler became very popular saying shit like this. His anti-business and anti-war rhetoric resonated very, very strongly with the nation recovering from the Great War and in the midst of the Great Depression. At the conclusion of World War I, all veterans received a bonus which was set to actually be paid out in 1945, a time when America would, of course, definitely have more money. 
But the economic hardship of the Great Depression caused over 20,000 veterans to begin camping at the edge of Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1932, demanding the immediate payment of these bonuses. Butler, of course, was firmly supporting them. These men would end up being referred to by the press as the Bonus Army. Butler, a lifelong Republican, became disillusioned with then-President Herbert Hoover's inaction, and so threw his support behind the Democratic candidate in the following election, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whose platform was built on the New Deal. Now, the New Deal accomplished many things, uh, all of which were, of course, communist. Did you know that America was communist? I figured that out during the research for this video. I'm, I'm shocked. You think you know a guy. I mean, really think about it. Social security? You really thought you could sneak that one by us, huh, FDR? You crippled fu- The New Deal contained a great many measures which I just won't get into. But the big thing was regulation of banks, namely in the form of the Glass-Steagall Act and the creation of the SEC. Now, in case you were wondering, Glass-Steagall was repealed decades ago, and the SEC is now just an empty office building with a phone constantly ringing and a weird smell coming from the closet. General MacArthur, the man who would later go on to say, hey, let's nuke Korea, what's the worst that can happen, would take the National Guard to clear out this bonus army of disgruntled veterans and burn down their camps. It was this time, in this environment of fear, desperation, and hardship, that a man by the name of Gerald C. McGuire visited Smedley Butler at his home. This was the beginning of a series of interactions that can best be summarized thusly. Hey, if I give you $1,000, can you give a speech at the American Legion convention telling everyone that FDR sucks and that we need to get back on the gold standard? I don't trust the American Legion. Who's funding you? Where's the money coming from? What's the gold standard? Get the fuck out of my house. Ah, playing hard to get, huh? McGuire would try to involve Butler in myriad plots and schemes, all of which were suspiciously well-financed. These schemes would grow in size, significance, and funding until McGuire wanted Butler to lead 500,000 angry veterans to the Capitol so they could scare Franklin Delano Roosevelt into appointing an assistant president. These men would be paid $10 a month with $35 for captains. They would be armed by the Remington Rifle Company and financed by DuPont. Butler was to use his reputation as an anti-war and anti-business war hero to possibly start a war which was financed by big business. Butler took this information to a journalist named Paul Comley French, who would investigate Butler's various sources. In the end, they blew the whole thing wide open and a congressional investigation was launched. This army, thankfully of course, was never formed and never marched on Washington. You need to understand what people, ordinary people, not your weird uncle, thought about fascism during this time. It looked like a patriotic, pragmatic, anti-communist ideology, which could provide just the kick in the pants many nations needed. People were desperate. They needed change. McGuire admired fascism. His benefactors saw it as the only ideology which could prevent communists from taking control of America. Once again, these guys thought the New Deal was communist. According to the testimony of journalist Paul Comley French, we need a fascist government in this country, McGuire insisted, to save the nation from communists who want to tear it down and wreck all that we have built in America. The only men who have the patriotism to do it are the soldiers, and Smedley Butler is the ideal leader. He could organize a million men overnight. No one went down for this. This plot that implicated the DuPont Chemical Company of prominent J.P. Morgan executive, members of the Rockefeller family, and even, get this shit, uh, George Bush's grandfather, and, you know, uh, obviously if he's George Bush's grandfather, that means he's the other one's father. Reagan's butt buddy? I forget his name. Historian Sally Denton pointed out, The fascist plot which General Butler exposed did not get very far, but that plot had in it three elements which make successful wars and revolutions. Men, guns, and money. With God as my witness, one day... I'm going to get historians to acknowledge the fourth and most important ingredient.
The men who fight and die for our country enjoy the common air and light and nothing else. It is their lot to wander with their wives and children, houseless and homeless over the face of the earth. And when our generals appeal to their soldiers before battle to defend their ancestors' tombs and their temples against the enemy, their words are a lie and a mockery. For not a man in their audience possesses a family altar. Not one out of all those Romans owns an ancestral tomb. The truth is that they fight and die to protect the wealth and luxury of others. They are called the masters of the world, but they do not possess a single clod of earth that is truly their own. During the fall of the Roman Republic, a great topic of controversy was land reform. You'd leave your small farm and go fight abroad, and you'd return to find your wife couldn't manage it on her own because, <laughs> women. <laughs> and it was, you know, bought by some rich fucker who stayed home. This was a profane act. Every civilization has this collective, like, ideal citizen. In the Roman Republic, that citizen was a small farmer, self-reliant, disciplined, intelligent, but like in a practical, grounded way, not in a gay Greek way. Gay! Yeah, this was a consolidation of wealth by a small minority who didn't need any more, but it was also an attack on sort of the Roman spirit. Slaves were, of course, also brought back from the great military victories, slaves that would be put to use on these large farms owned by a wealthy elite. These slaves took jobs from the lower Roman classes across the board. What is not talked about enough is that Rome expanded at the expense of the common citizen. Roman expansion diluted the collective power of labor, opened new marketplaces and trading opportunities for the wealthy, and would lead directly to a slow drain on what little middle class existed. When Carthage is burned, its population enslaved, its wealth plundered, who benefits? Who truly stood to gain the most from the loss of such a massive mercantile empire? War is a racket. It's the oldest one there is. Tiberius Gracchus, the man who gave the speech that I read at the beginning of this segment, was a Roman general and senator who, on campaign, saw the countryside being sold out beneath the feet of the very men who fought under him. He tried to pass land reform, and for this act he was assassinated, his head was chopped off, and he was thrown into the Tiber. Then his brother tried the same thing, and you get it. But of course, land reform was eventually passed by Julius Caesar. One of the things which influenced me to begin making videos on Rome was when I reached out to a historian by the name of Tim Elliott after reading an article he wrote for Politico. The article was about how Trump was like Julius Caesar. You can make that comparison. Like, it's fair in a few ways. Populists circumventing political convention and being cheered on as they do it, you know? So I reached out to Mr. Elliott on Twitter, and I gave him a piece of my fucking mind. He responded very reasonably, and we had a good discussion. He pointed me towards many resources which would later serve as the foundation of my Rome videos. I'd pull up these DMs, but I got banned from Twitter again. Now there's some guy impersonating me on there. You should follow him though, he seems pretty cool. But I did believe, and still do believe, that the article is wildly off base, and it reads like an article written by and or for the upper middle class or even the upper class. This is a problem with both history and journalism. These are careers which are historically well respected, but don't pay well. They require secondary education, and of course, often require connections and financial support. Yeah, if you were wondering why every article on the internet reads like it was written by a weird alien bug person, that's why. It's because they most likely come from money, or were educated by people that came from money, and they work with people that come from money, like they're all just fucking weirdos, you know? I think the business plot was very feasible. Not because it had the backing of wealthy industrialists, and bankers, and a fascist organization, and not only because Smedley Butler was an incredibly popular war hero, but because over 20,000 veterans had gone to DC and asked for help, and the government shot at them. Tim Elliott's article drove me fucking crazy. It haunts me. I'm not joking. Every fucking paragraph starts with the correct thought process. 
only to reach an insane conclusion. The Romans of 59 BC were unaware they lived in a period now known as the Late Roman Republic. The same will be true of whatever time historians of the future refer to as the Late American Republic. If that period is to be averted, the lessons of the past must be learned. Alright, obviously pretty safe, pretty pedestrian thing to say, but you know, he's on the right track, so let's, let's bring it home, Tim, let's get it done, come on, Tim! The lesson that we need to learn from the past, according to the end of that paragraph, is that social media leads to echo chambers, which permit sort of a mob mentality and not proper debate, like that's, that's the problem. Bug people. Bug people shit. I'm sorry I'm calling you a bug person, Tim. You seem nice. But your article has been haunting me for years now, I need this. You remember, uh, you remember when there was a minimum wage increase amendment added to the COVID stimulus bill? Uh, it, still 725, I, I sort of can't fucking believe it. I made 725 when I was 16. Look at my fucking hairline. It's the same. It had been 725 for I think 10 fucking years when I was 16 too, like Jesus Christ, man. There was a minimum wage increase amendment added to the stimulus bill. Democrat Senator uh, Kirsten, I already hate the name, Cinema voted like this. Miss Cinema, Miss Cinema. Every article on the internet reads like it was written by and for bug people. The problem is not social media. It is not 4chan, or algorithms, or Trump, or misinformation, or trans people, or Asian hate, or anti-Semitism, or the fact that Biden does clearly have dementia. The problem is that no one can buy a house anymore. No one can afford rent anymore. We just spent two decades fighting wars that did nothing but scar our men and line war profiteer pockets, and everyone is eating poisonous food that keeps getting more expensive, and when it inevitably makes them sick, they can't afford to be made well again. Get a fucking grip! The Roman people did not fail the Republic. The Republic failed the people. Smedley Butler had seen the worst the system was capable of. He'd perpetuated some of the worst things it was capable of. But when push came to shove, he upheld his oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The wealthy have been buying our Republic. They've been doing it very slowly, but in the end, they will do it very suddenly. They have financed, lobbied, and bullied our nation's military into defending their investments across the globe. They have hollowed out our government and have destroyed the faith of our people in the ability of our republic to build a better future. They have sown hopelessness, and they will reap tyranny. Six Emperor Tyrannus, thanks for watching.